everyone and welcome to Almost Cancelled. I am Peter and today I'm going to be talking about The Nevers Season 1 Episode 4. It's called Undertaking. So full spoilers for the episode, as always. This show is so frustrating because I feel like this episode, a lot of the humour clicked a bit better. Not all of it. There was definitely a couple of duds in the jokes, but there was definitely some moments, particularly with Penance, who is kind of becoming the the obvious, like, comedy favourite, as far as her, her comic timing, her lines, some of the, the, the beats, and even when she's not in the scenes, her influence in other scenes, and, like, when people talk about her, it seems to add a bit of humour to the, the, the whole proceeding. So there's some base-level things that felt a bit better in this episode, uh, but I do think there's some plot stuff that falls flat, and I would say that last episode is the better of the, the bunch still just because of that. Uh, the, the main thing I'm going to bring up here is the the Lucy reveal, the, the reveal that Lucy is actually working for Lord Lord Masson, and that she's been feeding intel and you know sets up this kind of fake uh, mission where she sort of puts the idea in their head. Hey, he's got a munitions factory. We could all we could go and get get our you know get some revenge on him and make a statement by going to burn that, only to find out that it's only rocks that are stored there. And you know, Amalia sort of puts puts it together a little bit. Um, this moment, though, honestly, just kind of felt very abrupt, and I didn't feel like we've spent enough time with Lucy for this to have much of an impact. And I'm not necessarily, I'm not even necessarily critiquing that it doesn't add up. Like, yeah, I mean, she goes into her backstory a bit more here, where she says, you know, my baby died in my hands. I've not touched a human being, and you know, I hate what we are. He's going to cure me, kind of thing. These are fairly understandable plot threads to go down in terms of ideas when you've got a world with these types of characters. Uh, you know, the, the X-Men have done it, again, compare it to the X-Men, but the idea of certain mutants wanting a cure because their power is detrimental or makes their life difficult or stops them from having human interaction. You know, Rogue, especially in the movies, uh, that was all she ever did was whine about she's not being able to touch anyone. And I'm not saying that it's not understandable, but it made her kind of one note in those um and Lucy here, I don't feel like we we got enough of the, the 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 relationship she had with Amalia, and to an extent some of the others to really feel the betrayal of the moment. You know, obviously she acts, you know, Amalia that is, she acts like a it's a complete betrayal, and so does Penance afterwards. But ultimately, it it just, it just feels a bit like okay, uh, you know, it feels too early to be pulling this and having it mean anything ultimately, other than. Other than making it feel like four episodes in, we're still just sort of like getting to who the the real core group is because we've you know we've lost you know Mary and that was a good surprise in the sense that it was an effective death, but you know okay so she's not part of the main group uh properly then but but you know Bonfire Annie is and so we're still kind of like piecing together what the actual main group is still not that episode four is like a super late time to still be doing that but. It feels like where some of the other elements have made strides forward, and because I'm a bit more interested in, in you know, the investigation of Mary's death, them sort of getting to the truth, which I'm not sure if they have. Like, you know, Lucy seems to think uh, that Masson's behind it, and that's kind of what uh, Amalia gets the conclusion she gets to after a conversation. And her her scene with uh, Masson was actually quite good. Uh, it was kind of a, you know, the scene where the, the, the hero and the villain of the piece kind of discover what they're both about, or more more importantly, what the hero discovers about the villain and just how much he cares about this and how he sees the, the touched as a disease. Um, and he sort of stands and makes his ground. I didn't necessarily take this as confirmation of anything, though. I'm still kind of on the, uh, the Lady Bidlow uh, <laughs> did it <laughs> campaign because, A, we know about what else she's got going on, but obviously... Uh, just everything else with her. And the characters do bring her up. I, again, I, I do appreciate that early on in the episode when they get into a room and they're talking about suspects and they go through the potentials and, you know, Amalia brings up Masson and she has the vision of seeing him in, the, uh, in his house. But then we also have the other, like, obvious possibilities, like the Beggar King and... Uh, Swan and you know some of the great comedy I was talking about earlier with Penance is when they bring up Augie, uh, she immediately goes because she just gives this speech about how it shouldn't be about revenge and it shouldn't be about for another mother, uh, but as soon as they mention his name, she says something like, 
yeah, that's him. He's the ringleader. Get him. Or something to that effect. It was like her mood completely changes. And it was, it was very... It was, it was funny. Um, and in every reference to her hatred of him because she's mad at him for the way he spoke to her last episode. Every reference to that was funny. And then the actual scene where she goes to speak to him was genuinely quite amusing where he's trying to apologize for the way he spoke to her but she thinks he's talking about the murder so when he says i did it and i I shouldn't have and i felt terrible since you know and she immediately goes oh you're a horrible person you and she starts you know she's got the the recording device in her skirt and whatever but it's pretty i i mean that stuff was amusing enough the what i thought made this scene really funny though was the ending to the scene which is after they've kind of made some kind of amends, he's kind of promised that he's going to earn back her trust because he wants her to be his friend, blah, 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 blah. She just kind of casually says at the end of the scene, well, do you think your sister did the murder then? <laughs> and it was a pretty funny, you know, scene in there. It was, it was amusing. And they're not really questioning Bidlow too much at this point. They do admit that they, they don't necessarily know they can completely trust her, so they're not being idiots as characters, but... Um, yeah, it is interesting. Uh, looking into it, I. So yeah, like I say, the Lucy twist the, the felt like nothing. Uh, you know, ultimately, Amalia chooses not to kill her. Um, basically, you know, thanks Penance's uh, morals for that. But she says you have to get out of the city. You have to if you ever come back, if I ever see you in London again, you're dead. But it does ask her for information first. We don't actually get to know all the information she told her. But we do know that they did find the real munitions. Uh, which was set up at the start of the episode, of course. Uh, with Masson uh, quickly putting stop to a, a little strike that was happening. Uh, with all the, all the workers at his factory. Or his warehouse, or whatever it was. So, you know, plot stuff, fine. Uh... You know, Masson's reaction when he, you know, he's getting the phone call because, you know, we had a whole subplot last episode about, about getting his phone line put in. And when he gets the news, he's acting all shocked, but he's thinking, oh, it's just the decoy with the with the, the rocks, right? Not, it's not the real munitions. But then when the guy in the phone specifies the location, he has the, the way he's, you know, he literally puts the phone on the other side because obviously it's one of the old phones with the two separate parts. And he, you know, he puts it on the other side and it's, it literally kind of swivels round and it's like, a change in the mood. Uh, so that was, a, that was a decent enough moment, for sure. And there's some interesting lore stuff being added here and some teases. You know, we've talked a lot bit about who Amalia really is, the, the different name, uh, what else is going on with her. And there's some really interesting bits added to it in this episode. First and foremost, we... There's a, there's a line when she's talking to Lucy. Uh... Lucy basically accuses her of, you know, you're a leader of this movement, like, you know, who are you exactly, what are you exactly, and she says something to the effect of, you know, I, I just got left behind, which immediately put the idea in my head, because, you know, we saw Amalia, or, you know, her previous name, which I'm forgetting, was it Molly? I would say it was Molly, uh, but we see her seemingly committing suicide or dying during the, you know, the incident, during the, the, the moment of being touched, as it were. Uh, my cats are making noise under my bed. They're distracting me a little bit. But it immediately gave me this idea that, you know, is it really her anymore? Like, did an entity from the ship actually sort of go into her body? Uh, is it she completely taken over? Or is it more of a, like a, a you know, a, a merging of two things? Like, is, is the, the person still kind of in there, but the, the alien or whatever she may be is, has taken over kind of thing? And I kind of like, so I don't know if that's what it was getting at. I was like, maybe the line was just a little bit, you know, oddly worded. Maybe I'm reading too much into it because it sounds kind of a cookie idea. And we're we're still early enough in the show that we could be introducing some crazy stuff like that. But then the ending, the ending to the other subplot, which ultimately ended the episode, which is the plot that uh, Myrtle heard or understood more precisely. She understood what Mary was singing about. No one else did. But she can, which ties into her power. The idea that she speaks all these different languages, but she can understand anything that anyone says, even if she can't sort of regurgitate it back out in the right way. So the, the subplot is that she ends up having this kind of mission where they get a bunch of other people who can speak, you know, d- various languages. You know, one person's there to re- represent one and the other and so on and so on. And they get a room full of people, all of whom can speak different languages between them. 
and trying to decipher because she's switching languages constantly and some of it's an ancient you know latin and stuff and it's, it's all mixed up but they kind of decode a message uh and at the end of the episode when they come in to tell amalia this who's kind of bonding with penance after everything that's went down they're having some chips uh and i love that penance hid the chips but then when myrtle revealed or they revealed what myrtle had done she kind of decided to reveal them to her i thought that was vaguely amusing but uh you know penance is the heart of the show i mean it's not just because she's funny but she's also the moral heart of the show uh so that's that's the character who they're going to threaten when they want us to feel bad she is the willow she is the willow of this show uh, and i don't want to dismiss the character or, or just sort of like make it feel like i'm simplifying or to just say that but that's kind of what willow was to buffy she she was the heart when someone put willow in danger you felt horrible and that was kind of the point is that she was there to be that uh, amongst other things but that was one of the 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 mechanics for which that character could could be used so the message is very interesting this person you know, as is pointed out in the scene this is not mary's voice mary's not the one saying this message mary doesn't know what she's saying this is someone communicating directly to Amalia. This is someone speaking to her, saying that she's there, that she's not alone, and that she wants to come find whoever this is. And you know, the others ask the question, who, who are we supposed to look for? Who is this? And as this is happening, Amalia breaks down into tears. She clearly recognizes this, who this is coming from. This is, this is not a case where if there is something else in Amalia... Uh, assuming my theory is right and some kind of alien entity has co-opted her body if not outright just taken over it she clearly knows this and she recognises this message Um, now Amalia still has a lot of natural human qualities which is why I'm thinking it's more of a merging of two things and the aliens kind of just hitching a ride. If, the, if if indeed this is what's going on, I kind of leapt to it because of the you know I was left behind, which I don't think was supposed to be meant literally, but I think we're supposed to kind of maybe think about it and go maybe it is literal. Um, so in this scene, like she recognizes it means a lot to her, and it's by far the most interesting mystery this show has had, or the most interesting thing it's sort of put forth as an idea, uh, and it explains why. You know, Amalia pre this event is seems to be a very, very different person to what she is now and post all this. Um, I, I'm very curious to see how they explore this. Um, it was a really good ending ha- having the other character just say, you know, uh, you know, who are we looking for, uh, kind of thing. That question ending the episode with a cut to black is a very strong way to end the episode, but it did leave me kind of frustrated. It left me frustrated because I was like, no, I want her to answer the question. Like, how is she going to either answer this or dodge it next episode? Because I don't know if she will just straight up get, give them an explanation. She might withhold. She might go a bit AWOL and go kind of solo and rogue and try and find information on her own. But I'll, I'll give I'll give the, the episode credit. As much as I was complaining that some of the plot stuff in this episode didn't land, I do think this ending tease and you know slash kind of reveal is probably the most interesting development the story's had so far so that's good (laughs) that's good and i feel like i feel like i've got this tone i feel like i have this tone where i'm not just like into it and it's because there is still kind of a, a, a disconnect there's something still not quite working there's still some lanes not landing there's plot elements not always landing uh you know i i think Mundy has been one of the more interesting characters. He's had a bit more depth than some of the others. And you know, we hear that he used to be a boxer in this episode, so he's very capable in a in a one-on-one fight. So that's good to know. Uh, more than we've seen thus far. But Malady's just there. She's just in the, the, the captain or the chief's office uh, strangling him. And he has this kind of confrontation with her uh, where... You know, Malady again is going very back and forth. You know, where she she's kind of mad that Mary got killed, but she was going to hang her anyway. You know, what she points out, but she wants all the lies to stop. She wants the press to stop lying about her. Uh, you know, the press have just assumed that she's behind the murder, and she's not. She that's not the truth. Uh, and we never really suspected it was. You know, we we I, I don't know that I did, certainly didn't. I never even thought for a second that it was really Malady that was behind all that. So 
but he gives chase and he actually catches her. Uh, and again, we we see a bit of the the, the moral side to to Monday, uh, despite the fact that he's this drunken asshole most of the time. Uh, he he stops the other cop because this other cop just wants to stab her. He's like, "We'll just stab her." Then the Monday steps in. No, no, she's going to face justice. We're not going to do have this bullshit. And he gets very very adamant about it. So yeah, it's another reason to kind of root for him. It's another reason to think that he despite his temperament and despite all the other things that clearly he has rough around the edges that there's a a core hero in there to really kind of root for and you know that's kind of you know as we reveal that through the the, the story in a tv show because you get in a tv show you can you can spread it out over time and you can sort of tease it a bit longer and you can do that but we're, we're kind of painting a picture of who some of these characters are um and you know some characters get left behind i, I do think um uh, uh, you know, Bonfire Annie. I'm still blanking on the names of so many of them, but Bonfire Annie. I do think her integration into the group is actually fairly smooth. I, I think she bounced off the others. It's kind of nice to have someone who's a very different kind of, you know, manner and temperament, and she's a bit more sly and cool and a bit more. I don't know. Uh, like when she's suggesting things in the scene. It's that, it's that one of the great examples you have in an ensemble is when you have two characters who feel that they should be opposed on something, when they agree on something, it does this neat thing where it kind of gives you the sense of the entire room because you get that everyone in between these two characters is also going to agree then. Um, so when they do both agree with something, uh, then it's like, because there's, there's two or three scenes in this episode where we have Amalia, uh, we have Penance, we have Bonfire Annie. I mean, the first scenes have uh, Lucy as well, of course. Uh, but we also have the Doctor character, um, Cousins. And he... And they kind of complete what this core set of characters at the house who try to figure things out are being. And I think the chemistry in those scenes... Uh, and it's notable that Lucy maybe stuck out as being the one that felt kind of separate in the first time. But now she's gone, so I guess that that's or at least for now anyway. I mean, maybe she'll have some sort of redemption, maybe she'll come back, maybe whatever. But when we do have this scene, like, it does feel like there's a nice bounce around the characters where it started to click a little bit more, where when... Because they basically agree there'll be no murder of any kind. Um, and again, there's some humour here because Amalia kind of explains, oh, we're not going to just kill someone or Masson because it wouldn't solve anything, it would just lead to another thing. And then Penance gives her a, an angry look and also goes, oh, because it's wrong, because the, the murder is very wrong, of course. And, you know, the humour. Not bad. But when when Bonfire Annie then says, oh, but, you know, if we don't do something, uh, you know, this, this, will, this will lead to them doing something worse. This will lead to escalation on their side until they do provoke a reaction. And it became this, like, uh, oh, well, let's do this then. So, um, but because Amalia agreed with her right away, it kind of gave you this sense that, okay, so we, we have two opposing ends of the spectrum now, and it feels like they're quite far apart, whereas it didn't necessarily feel, it, as much as Penance is, of course, very different from Amalia, it didn't necessarily feel like we had the uh, more uh, lawful, no, chaotic good. Uh, is that where we're going to put, <laughs> put uh, Bonfire Annie? Um... No, I mean, I mean, Amalia's pretty chaotic as well. I, she's more lawful good then. I don't, the point I'm trying to make is that they're very different, and they're because they're very different, it gives us more of a dynamic in these group scenes where they're discussing plans and ideas, as opposed to just it kind of feeling like we Amalia's taking charge, Penance is offering a bit of heart, but now we finally have someone who feels really opposed to a lot of what she might say, and that tension... Even, but it feels like a tension in a way that's growing a sort of dynamic, where it's, 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 this is going to be more of an unlikely friendship where eventually Bonfire Annie may actually be trusted, where there may actually be kind of a, a genuine bond that's formed from scratch in the context of, you know, for us, the audience, where we can see it from the, these early days where it's kind of an uneasy acceptance and alliance, but over time, maybe, we see more of a, more of a true heart coming from Bonfire Annie and her relationship with Amalia. So... It's interesting. They also set up the idea that, uh, you know, maybe Bonfire Annie may want to lead the team. And maybe that's something... And, and she says she doesn't. Maybe that's the sort of thing where maybe she can lead the team if for some reason Amalia goes AWOL at some point because she goes off on her own to maybe investigate this stuff that she cries over at the end, which we don't know about yet. 
uh, at a large way. So, yeah, that, that was uh, that was that was pretty solid stuff. Uh, Ma so Malady's in prison. Uh, she's in jail, uh, and they've got her under guard. So that's a, a key point for moving forward. Uh, as for um, anything else here, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm definitely forgetting something. I mean, there's a scene where Monday goes to confront Swan. I don't have much to say about it. They're they're playing a uh, chess, but with pieces of cheese that are kind of labelled with cocktail sticks as a fancy rich person's version of chess, so they can eat it afterwards. I guess because chess and cheese are very close words, and they thought it was funny. And <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if this is based on a real thing. I wonder if this is something that uh, people have actually done in the past as a uh, playing chess cheese or cheese chess, well, 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 however it would be uh, said. Uh, oh, there's a scene where Bonfire Annie goes and meets uh, a, a new character uh, who works for the Bear King, uh, Nimble, who makes uh, like metal discs almost that can be used as a sort of projectile blade, but also as a platform to leap out of the scene. It was a strong character introduction. Uh, they felt very, you know, upbeat, a lot of attitude, very quick witted. Um, and sometimes this show, I, I think to its detriment almost, like the, the quick wit sometimes gets lost in the shuffle because they're kind of mixing it in old timey speak um, and a little bit of like English slang. It Sometimes, you know, I'll miss lines. Sometimes I'll miss a phrase here or there. And if it sounds like it was, a, it was an important piece of information, like maybe I'll go back and whack it on the subtitles to hear it properly. But sometimes I, I just, I won't because I'm not going back. It's, that's not my problem if, if your dialogue's not clearly audible. But, like I say, it was clicking more in this episode for the most part. Um, like I say, most of the stuff with Penance and most of the stuff that related to her influence on the others tended to have some good humour around it. Um, or even her just saying birds are stupid when she was still mad at Augie. It's like, yeah, he really likes birds and birds are stupid. And because she's almost going to say something and then she's sort of, although notably she does tell Amalia at the end that uh, what his power is and that he's touched and that he's scared of telling his sister. So, yes, she, she, did, she did pass that information on. Um, we'll see if uh, there's a consequence to that, or if he won't even care by the time it's even relevant. Uh, very possible. But, yeah. So, okay episode. Uh, I, I think it... You know, s seeing the reactions to the characters, uh, particularly uh, Amalia, who doesn't go to the funeral for, for Mary, and Monday, who almost takes off the two guys' heads who show up and yell obscenities because there is a funeral for someone who's touched, uh, calling her a freak and all the rest of it. Like, the emotional reactions to things were good. I mean, I suppose one thing I will say about this episode is this by far had the least of, uh, of Swan, and that's a good thing. <laughs> I mean, he's definitely been my least favourite part, so the less I've had to deal with him in his stupid club uh, has definitely been for the better thus far. Uh, and maybe, maybe it'll all be justified when it plays into plot. I don't know. Um, we only have two episodes left before us goes on a break because they only shot six of the episodes um, before they had to shut down. So I'm very curious why they made the choice to still air these before they finished the rest of the season. And it does make me wonder if episode six does actually have a very neat kind of mid-season ending. Not one that concludes the story, but we seem to be going into some very interesting stuff with with Amalia and her backstory, which I wonder if that will really sort of turn the show on its head and maybe give it that missing spark that's kind of been been absent and, you know, until now has felt very, yeah, you know, it's just a derivative, I guess, of, of other things. Um, but it's not a totally bad time. That said, there, there wasn't any scenes this week that were as impressive as the, the water fight scene from last episode, for example. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see. But hey, uh, there you go. That's uh, the Nevers episode four. So thank you very much for joining me. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments. You can like and subscribe, of course. It's very helpful if you do that. YouTube gauges success based on that sort of stuff. So please do, and it'll help us find more of an audience. Uh, you can, of course, also support us financially over at patreon.com slash TV for as little as $1 per month and get some bonuses for your trouble. So go and have a look and see if you're interested. But otherwise, that is me. So thank you once again for watching or listening. I always appreciate it. Keep watching TV. Have you got any vanilla?